We're on a fir our first gigs across the tundra since last year, and uh, we are with Big Heaven, or specifically Mandy from Big Heaven. <laughs> Sup? Hey. 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 <laughs> Good Thanks to be for here. coming. We really actually really appreciate it. My so, pleasure. Yeah. Um, I think you're actually our first guest guest, aside from my buddy Billy Bocci, who's in a band, but I've known him for 19 years, so I don't think he counts. We were, we were supposed to have Victor on last week, but that guy got too busy for us, so... <laughs> He's coming back in a couple weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. So on gigs, we usually talk about like our most recent gig, and um, we usually break that down, and we try to talk about like some worst gigs, some best gigs, stuff like that. That uh, sounds perfect. So how did your most recent show go, and where was it? It was at um, Distribution Bar last Saturday for the Lost in Sound music series that's been happening. Okay, cool. Um, and we got on... That was on Saturday, and we were asked to play it on Wednesday. So it was very last minute, so we were not sure how the crowd was going to be, but we just promoted it a lot, and fortunately there were other really great bands on the bill, and um, it went incredible. It was really cool. Heck, yeah. Um, how did you hear about that? Social media. Just, oh, okay, cool. Um, and normally I find those things just scrolling, but this particular one, since Lost in Sound is replacing um, Friday on the Green, so everybody's ear was kind of to the ground about, since Friday on the Green is going away, what's gonna happen next? Yeah. So I got a text from Kevin, our guitar player, as soon as they announced about Lost in Sound and the application process. So um, I was like, I'm on it. So I applied. And um, so any band can apply. And basically, you go, on, go onto a database. And then the venues that are part of the Lost and Sound series are in charge of putting their bills together. Oh, cool. So is that the thing that you sent me the other week? It is. Yeah, I yep. just I heard that. about it. Yeah. I was yeah. figuring out uh, Alexa's you got to get on it. Yeah. It's really cool. And then they make you a cool little profile so the venue owners can go and look and see. Like, it has your picture and your links and everything. Cool. So, yeah, it's it's pretty right. neat. Nice. That's really cool. And uh, I heard that they do it, uh, like, a couple of times a year is what they're going to try to do. I know for sure they've got two in the fall. Okay. I want to say there's one in August, but don't quote me on that. So that would be it's lostinsound.org if y'all want to go check that out. And they also have a um, Instagram and I think a Facebook page. But um, I know, you know, like back when in the Friday on the Green Days, they they took out summer because it was so hot. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they're doing that for this because some venues are inside, so they might not need to. But there's definitely one in September and one in October. Yeah, 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 I saw that. So um, cool. Yeah, that's so cool. That's cool. I like how they have like a site with all the bands info. Yeah, yeah that's really great. Yeah, I saw that and I was like, oh. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good way to We're do it. We're official. Yeah. Sweet. Um, you recent gig? Uh, yeah. So uh, I'm gonna just explain to you, Mandy, real quick. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm in a bunch of bands. I'm in Mr. Igloo. I play in a cover band called uh, uh, Guilty Pleasures. Um, I do a bunch of uh, electronic music, you know, pretty much. Um, and so we were, he was asking me to, to, to come up with another, you know, good story on. Uh, oh, a worse gig. Uh, of, a, of a worse gig. Gotcha. Um, well, last Friday was a pretty terrible one. So the whole thing about Guilty Pleasures is we've only been a thing for about a year now. Um, and a big struggle with every band, uh, I think, is, is stage volume, you know. And our attempt at solving that is going silent stage, which means um, – so I have over here, you see, I run a Helix for everything. So that's where I get all of my live guitars. Obviously, I have amplifiers. I love amplifiers. They're my pride and joy, but uh, I've been doing this long enough that I get sick and tired of carrying all this crap out to the gigs. So, Amen. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so so the entire band is on a Helix system. We, uh, I play through a Helix. Our guitarist plays through a Helix. Our other guitarist plays through a Helix, sorry. And uh, our bassist uh, has like a DI system with his, with his rack mm. unit. So we're all in-ears which means that anything that can go wrong will go wrong because 
there's no hardware to back anything up, right? Um, so the entire night we're having sound issues. Um, nobody can hear me, the lead guitarist. Nobody, you know, the rhythm guitar singer, uh, George, is way too loud. And of course, in my in-ears, in all of our in-ears, I'm the loudest one in the band. George has a Behringer X Air, the the um, remote uh, um, mixer mixer that the oh, entire yeah. the entire thing is done through a phone app, right? Um, and some wires got crossed and we're hearing a mix that is not in any way indicative of the mix going out to front of house. So for half of the gig, I, you can hear in, in our in-ears, you can hear no drums, no bass, mm -hmm. a little bit of George's voice and all of my guitar. And out in the front, I'm, uh, you know, in front of house where the audience actually is, I am completely dead silent. So, uh, the, so, so that was a struggle. Um, and of course in our attempt to fix everything, I'm cranking volumes on the helix and trying to get things figured out. Um, I end up, um, way, I, I end up just constantly like, blowing out so i blew out one of the uh one, one of the drivers in one of my in-ears my my sure uh se 215s yeah. don't work anymore they normally just do that on their own so so i so i blow out the i blow out the left driver of of my in-ears i have to borrow jubal our bassists uh uh az's um so man, it's just a nightmare. It's just it's just a nightmare. We've just we've just been having sound problems the entire night, um, and pretty much by the end of it, um, everything is is just going to shit. So I say, you know what the hell? So I try changing patches on the Helix, only not having realized that everything that I was like manipulating totally got unsaved and so i lost like all of my sounds <laughs> no. for, the la for the last set so i'm scrambling between sets two and three um basically trying to rebuild my patch yeah. from from the ground up trying to trying to get something rolling um y'all had three sets it's a cover band so right we, right so we so we play for about three to four hours yeah and there's you know breaks in between each set um so sounding like the recording is pretty important Actually, no. So we do interpretations of these songs. Okay. Um, and one of the things is we are a rock band that does covers of, you know, things, uh, you know, guilty pleasures. We're, we're, we cover everything from, you know, pop music from the 60s, 70s, all the way up to, you know, recent stuff. And I'm a very improvisational guitarist. I don't know half of these songs. So I'm just... I'm just jamming along, holding on for dear life. The crowd seems to love it, so I, so I haven't, you know, um, if it ain't broke, don't fix it yet. Yeah. Um, but, uh, so, like, for instance, okay, we do a, um, who wrote Hand in My Pocket? Because I... Alanis Morissette. Alanis Morissette, yeah. Okay, so we do an interpretation of Hand in My Pocket where I turned it into, like, uh, are you familiar with uh, like Queens of the Stone Age or yes. or Caius or like any of those like desert rock bands? Obviously, Queens yeah. of the Stone Age. Yeah. yeah. So I'm a big Josh Homme fan, um, not as a person, just as as a musician. Um, <laughs> right. And and so we do a Queens of the Stone Age reinterpretation of Hand in My Pocket. Uh, another example would be we do probably what every band has done since the song came out. We do Seven Nation Army. But I go full Nile Rodgers on it and turn it into a funk tune. Oh, how Heck fun! Yeah. Um, and so on and so forth. So, so we're we're very transformative with with these tracks. But it's still a problem whenever all of the sounds that I've been using just go kaput. Of course. We have a good nightmare story from the last Mr. Igloo show. Yeah. Well, let's see if you have a worst gig story. Okay. Well, does it have to be Big Heaven? No, it can be any band. Okay, yeah. excellent, because I've been doing this for a long time. For sure. Um, and 
I don't have any ill will toward this person, so I won't say his name. Name we'll drop. <laughs> name drop. <laughs> we'll, we'll bleep it out. So I'm going to say the name that you can bleep out, we and then I'll that. say the name of the band that can stay in. Cool. Okay. So had a band called Sloan Automatic which then became the more you know, as in bum, 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 okay. the more you know. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So by the time Reading I Rainbow? was playing with, yes. no, no, just wait. those little um, public service announcements oh. okay. I, on NBC. Yeah. I'm a little, I, I had my wires crossed, yeah, but it has Reading Rainbow vibes. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so the more you know was this project with um, that person, and it was very experimental in the instrumentation um, in the selection of songs, you know, we would choose, let's see, like we covered a Prince song and we added a clarinet to it. Okay. Things cool. like that. Cool. Um, we had a, a cellist all the time. Um, but it was fun, you know, and I was a lot younger and like, okay, you know, I'm, I'll try this. That was one of my first um, chances to play, to play bass, for example. I played bass on a couple of songs. Anyway, we had this Christmas I want to say it was Christmas Eve Eve, but it was right around. It, I don't think it was Christmas Eve, but it might have been. But it was either the 23rd or the 24th. Yeah. And we had this gig at Lola's, yeah. uh, the original Lola's. Man, I miss that place. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, had, I had some really happy gigs there, too. Yeah. But, this, but this particular one was very interesting. And we had um, – so we had this gig planned. And we'd been playing all year uh, occasionally, and everything was kind of fine and all that. And um, so we get there, and we're like two or three out of like four. It was a big, a big bill. And our drummer who was playing, who had a rotating cast of drummers, as you do, and this particular drummer is about five foot five. He's a really good drummer, but he's not tall, right? Yeah. So he gets behind, he sits behind the kit, and we all get ready. And then band leader rolls this giant flat screen TV, and this was like 2011 or 12, so the real thick flat screen TVs, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, rolls it out, because it's part of our stage show, and puts it right in front of the drum kit. <laughs> and he's like, what? <laughs> like, so now he can't see. And then, I want to say Blue Christmas was on our set, you know, like, and then some originals. And the show proceeds... And every song is opened up with like this 30 to 45 second diatribe of something. And all of us are just trying to be like professional and play the songs. And we got, we kind of had some sound issues too, but I think we just had too much going on. Mm -hmm. Like we had too many people trying to do things. And um, at one point in the middle of the set, I will name drop this one. Tony Diaz goes, <laughs> Happy birthday, Jesus. I hope you like your present because it was going so poorly and so weirdly and people were leaving. Yeah. And um, man, somehow we finished that and it was it was very weird. What what was like the what like what do you mean by a diatribe? Like he was just he was just talking like he would just, just talk personal stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like stuff that didn't really have awesome. to do with the song. Like he wasn't introducing the song. He would like go off on some kind of social tangent or something. I don't. That's a I kind of disassociated because it was just so embarrassing. <laughs> oh, and I remember this too is that we had a rehearsal right before that, so we should have been real tight and ready to go. And my kids were really little at the time, and I remember it was a whole thing because I had to like take them to my parents' house so that they could watch them, so I could have this gig. Sure. And uh, it was like. I'm not sure that this is worth all of that at this point. And so I called yeah. him the next day and quit. <laughs> <laughs> I always think that's weird that the singers that have like, that are like talking personal stuff on stage. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. It wasn't personal, like super personal, but it was like, something he was passionate about sure, but yeah. it, it didn't keep the sure. it didn't keep the flow it was so yeah it was it broke the flow separate so yeah. so like yeah. walk, walk walk me through this real because because there are bands that do that that i like yeah sure, but they're yeah. all like highly politicized punk bands no see we know? weren't that at all yeah. yeah our whole thing was just we love songs and we're going to perform some songs right and um 
I don't. So that's why it was very strange. It's like um, one of my favorite modern punk bands, uh, Pup. They're from Canada. They, yeah, for sure. You know, write incredible songs. But whenever I saw them, and you don't go to a punk show not expecting uh, politics. It, it's yeah. it's like the two go hand in hand. For sure. Um, and they had a voting registration booth set up and like that was the theme of the night they were like they were making a big deal about like register to vote and make and and like make an impact and they brought it up like six or seven like like in between every single song just just you know hey we got this booth back there go do the thing and then i saw a kid fly 16 feet in the air with a bloody nose you know in the middle of the first song you can't get much more punk rock than that yeah that's pretty punk, but you know that's the purpose of them being there, right? Yeah, yeah. they're yeah. they're 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 a band that their whole thing is like animal rights, and you know, right. you know, uh, they 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 have so many songs that are just about critters and 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 life and you know like yeah. uh, uh, non human life, I guess. Yeah, you know, um, and I don't I don't I don't expect to speak for uh, the guys in that band, but you know they they seem pretty like. Every single one of them was really, really passionate about what they were talking about, you know. Yeah. Um, but my point being is that's the right venue for it. You exactly. Know? Like that, you know, you go to a punk rock show expecting that. I'm anticipating what you're talking about. This this project was like more of like, uh, let's go play at the old folks home almost kind of thing. Well, like, it wasn't quite like that, but it was it was experimental pop. Sure. But it was not political. Right. It was really like... It was experimental pop, and it right. was about the music. Right. You know, yeah. and so that's why it was. And then somebody said, I don't know if he took his medication today. <laughs> <laughs> so that might have been a factor as well. And I'm trying to remember if, we, if the TV, like, I remember that there were issues with the TV even being able to be plugged in and project whatever well, weird visual. Yeah, was. I was going to ask, what was he even putting was on the TV? like a visual, okay. you know, like a, a backdrop visual okay, kind of cool. thing, you know, which would have been cool and would have been fine. But I, you know, I think all it did was block the drummer. Yeah. Who couldn't see. I mean, I will never forget the look on his face. He was like. What? <laughs> <It was laughs> That's like, so funny. We should pull that yeah. on Alexis. That was, <laughs> but that the TV wild. will come on and it can just be a video of Alexis playing. Drums, <laughs> okay, right? That's or good. like a cartoon yeah. Alexis. Yeah, yeah a video a, of just the Just put drummer. a camera on her and then put the <laughs> yeah. in front of her. So you're yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's why I just, that's why I sing. So that way, since I'm short, I just, I'm right in the front. Exactly. I don't have to have See, that problem yeah. at all. Yeah. So my drummer, my current, um, I was going to say, my current drummer's really tall, so. <laughs> um, Let me see. Well, I have one that wasn't the worst, but it was kind of funny. Mm -hmm. Um. So Big Heaven started at the end of 2017. Oh, I've got two. Okay, so the very, very, very first ever Big Heaven show was at the Dreamy Life Library Library in Fairmount. I don't know if any of y'all ever I went there. Um, well, okay, let me back up. Fairmount Library, which is a little like community library, and then Dreamy Life Records had their record store in the library. So they would host bands like in front of the books. It was really cool. And the sound was great because there was carpet and books. Yeah, so this, all that yeah. stuff. Oh my gosh. Acting is like absorption. That's like that, yeah. that band perfect. Soccer had a show like that too. Mm -hmm. Where, who's that? Um, they're another band we did on Bands Across the Tundra that hasn't come out yet. Nice. But we saw a video. That's where I saw them was from a video where they were playing at a library. I'm yeah. telling you. Yeah. A library cool. with carpet. That is the best sounding what, place. Why do you think NPR Tiny Desk sounds so good? That's yeah. true. Good point. Yeah. But um, the very first, uh, December 1st, 2017, and somehow we had gotten, it was me and a guy named Jesse, we started the band together, and somehow we had gotten some press, like, in Central Track, and people, like, knew who he was, I guess, because nobody knew who the hell I was. And so people were excited to see us, and Cameron Smith introduces us, and I went up to play the first chord of Rock Bottom, which we still play, and my guitar wasn't plugged in. <laughs> <laughs> and Jesse goes, dude. I was like, I know, I'm so sorry. Because my input had this weird, th it was like, it was not in there good. And it's, I, uh, yeah. it's an input jack issue. So I didn't want to plug it in. And I was like, I'll remember to do that before I pick up my guitar. And I didn't because the adrenaline was going. Mm. So, but after that, like that one thing, it was like, 
if he hadn't introduced us, it would have been fine. But yeah. it was like, here's Big Heaven, and then bunk, nothing. nothing. Yeah. Yeah. So that was really embarrassing. And then, um, but That's the rest awesome. of it was fine. And then in March of 2018, do you all remember Zine Fest? It used to be at Shipping and Receiving. It, it, I think it happened no. two years in a row. It was this cool little festival, you know, zines and all that stuff. And we played it, the fir- I think we played it two years in a row. We definitely played it the first year. And it was at Shipping and Receiving, which is now Distribution Bar, where I gotcha. played last Saturday. Um, and it was me and Jesse, and we were just like rocking out. We were real scrappy at that time. We were guitar and drums, and that's it. And um, I'm, I'm very clumsy, and I always have been. And I stepped on an input and unplugged something in the middle of a song. And it was like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. And I had, like, my pedal board, and I couldn't figure out what had unplugged exactly. So then I just, I took, like, it took, like, 30 to 45 seconds. I'm sure it wasn't that long. But it felt like an hour, yeah. you know. And so I just, I finally unplugged everything and just plugged right back into the amp and picked up at the chorus of the song. And everybody was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> they don't so, know they I guess those know. aren't really bad but they were definitely like very low points that fortunately recovered yeah yeah so something you know. about something about first gigs and input jacks my very first gig I ever played like I'm in high school it was like a talent show all right and um, I was in the quote unquote dressing room, which was, you know, it's the high school auditorium. So I'm literally just in yeah. one of the classrooms, just sitting there and, and, and warming up on my cheap little Roland cube 60 amp, which has <laughs> plastic, uh, input Jack, uh, hex nuts. Right. And <laughs> my, and our drummer sits on my amp <laughs> crack and the entire little uh the the hex nut broke and the input fell into the inside of the amp uh. right so this is 4 minutes before we go on right uh. and i just lost my amplifier so i am in absolute panic mode i saved the day because i luckily just Happened to have I don't I, I don't even know where I got a hold of it but I got a hold of a screwdriver and like a, a pair of pliers I unscrewed the entire uh, head out of the out of the combo pulled it out fished out the the input jack pulled one of the hex nuts off the back of the amp like one of the one of the line out ones and like screwed it in and like bada bing bada boom nice but like what a nightmare man. How pissed were you at him? I wasn't so much angry at him as like, I'm a very high anxiety person. So I was terrified. I was freaking out. I was like, you know, you know, nowadays I just roll with the punches. I'm like, oh, something broke. All right. What do we do? You know, but, but at the time I had never had the, the, everything is exploding on me all at once experience. So I was just in absolute panic devastation mindset uh you know i thought i i could have just puked and died right there and uh, i i, I would have been happy you know oh yeah wow <laughs> i don't know why puke had to be a part of it too i was <laughs> oh, just from the anxiety puke and die yeah. <laughs> puke and die is, is the secret to, to happiness in life yeah <laughs> I yeah. mean, sometimes. <laughs> like, oh, it feels so much better. <laughs> it was funny you were mentioning, like, um, you know, Big Heaven being, like, stripped down to just guitar and drums at one point. Because that was, before we had Alexis, it was just me and Roman. And that was a suggestion when we couldn't find a drummer was, man, he said, like, man, why don't we do, uh, why don't I play drums and you play guitar? And I was like, no, fuck no. <laughs> <laughs> I, said, I was like, no, I'm not going to do it. It was but fun. It, worked out. it was, Yeah. I feel like that kind of like stripped down thing really, really works if you're either like the White Stripes or there was a local band around here called The Good Kind of Mushroom. Sure. And that band was twacked out. They got clever with it. The guy would run like a, like an XY split out of his pedal board yes. into like a bass amp and a guitar amp. Yes. And like did all sorts of funky stuff to to get a much fuller sound than a two piece yeah. would actually be. Well, and I'm just gonna be honest with myself. I don't I'm a I'm very I'm a very good rhythm guitar player, but I don't have the lead chops to to you. do both sides of that, you I know? Feel you. And so for <laughs> me and 
and I still don't. I really didn't have a big enough amp to make that thing. Like, I needed a Marshall half stack. Right. And I was playing through an orange, like, um, I don't remember the, an orange. Right. You know. Crush 60. Yeah, yeah. sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, that's what I had at one point. Um, but then we eventually, like, he decided he really wanted to play guitar. So he got his friend Ricky to play drums. So then I moved to bass. And then people were like, whoa, okay, now it sounds like big. Right. You know, because I, you know. I don't know, but but it was fun, and it was like, man, I really wish sometimes, and this is just like the simple simplicity of two people, the yeah. scheduling ease. For sure, you know, you can go in one car. Yeah, <laughs> just the practicality mm -hmm. of it. Um, can I can, can I geek out about some gear real quick? Totally. Um, Do it. Let me ask what 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 are you running right now? What's your what's your like main setup? Um, well, don't get too excited because <laughs> I play through a Fender combo that actually belongs to um, Kevin, our guitar player, Kevin cool. Wellendorf. Um, I am looking at getting an SVT3 Pro, though, oh, Okay. because cool. I'm also I do um, bass gigs on the side for yeah. choirs and like lots of cover songs. Yeah, where yeah. I get to sit down and read music and not, you know, practice a little bit, but mostly it's reading. So I really need to make that investment. But my and my favorite bass to play is my 2005 Mexi P bass. OK, cool. I mean, I've like. Her name is Bernadette, mm -hmm. and we've just seen some stuff. <laughs> um, Any cool mods or anything that you've done to it? No. Oh, well, just the pit guard. Okay. I changed out from a white to a red pit guard. Okay. So cool. it's red on black. All right, cool. Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty, I'm pretty. Uh, kind of a My Chemical Romance kind of vibe. Yeah. yeah. There you go. <laughs> cool. Yeah. No, I'm pretty low key. Um, Any but, yeah. pedals or effects or anything? Do you get weird? I used to get weird, um, but not anymore. I do. I used to play through um, a blue box. Oh, okay. Those yeah. Are, those are fun. I had that on my board. I and um, <laughs> let's see. I played around MXR with some, blue box or yeah. okay, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I played around. I have a really cool. Um, what's the brand? Joyo from China. They make uh, an analog delay. I have you a, know that I one? have a Joyo amp. Uh, oh, I didn't know they made amps. Un underneath, underneath that hat over there. It is it, hidden underneath oh, it is okay. a little 20 watt version of that EVH 5150 right there. Oh, rad. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's like it's a clone, right? Yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I didn't know they made amps. But then my son started playing guitar, so I gave him my pedal board. Oh, okay. <laughs> so now he plays with all that stuff. Okay, okay. So favorite effect? Favorite effect for bass? For favorite effect. Favorite effect, period. Chorus. And phaser are pretty much right there. But I think chorus is more uh, useful. Cool. Mm -hmm. But I, I just love a phaser. Like cool. a well used. Same. Yeah. Uh, any, yeah. Uh, any, uh, any specifics in mind? I mean, the CE, what is it, CE2? Yeah. Just the cl classic boss. The John CE2. Frusciante special. Yes. Yeah. 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 And I love MXR pedals because I love the button. Yeah. And and I love one knob. Like, I'm very, like, I need one pickup. Phase 90. Yeah, yeah I yeah. love a phase 90. Cool. I don't want a million choices. I will not know what to do with all of that. <laughs> yeah. So. What's a um, flip side? What's a best gig? Like, what's something where it couldn't have gone better? Uh, well, we played a house party um, in April. I think it was in April. It was, um, I mean, it was a party. It was, it was billed as a house show, and it was because yeah. there were a whole bunch of bands. Um, and it's this place called Art House. Yeah, it was just, just the energy, and everybody was just around us. And I yeah. just, I love small gigs like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we could hear fairly well. That's all. That's always important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and just everybody was into it. Um, what else was a really good one? Give me a minute. <laughs> I'll, I'll think of one that was like freaking incredible, <laughs> but that that was the one recently. Besides last Saturday, last Saturday yeah. was really good too. But that was also a small. I really love playing on the same level as the audience. Yeah, I like I like feeling like I'm surrounded and we're just like we're all in this together. Um, you can't do the dope ass stage walk if you have to jump down like six flights of stairs to get out. Well, very true. Exactly. Very and, true. And like Kevin's real good about like he'll walk out and like he's he's very showy too. So yeah, yeah those are my favorite gigs, I think. 
When I was with, I, we, I was a two-piece briefly with me and a guy named Steve Pegler who played, he has like, he's like synth lord. So we were very, nice. uh, we were like way more new wave sounding. Yeah. And we got this show at a record store in Waco called, oh my gosh, it's not called Off the Record. But anyway, that was a really cool show. We like drove down to Waco for the day and we're like, what's this all about? And they set us up in the corner and then they turned off all the lights and like did all these crazy lights. I was like, oh, I can't believe we're in a record store with like a good light show and everything. Yeah, I do love the lighting Yeah, at, at Growl. Yeah, and, yeah. And, uh, at, at most of those record stores have something kind of cool going on with the lighting usually. That matters. Yeah, it does. Yeah. It does a lot. Heck but I don't yeah. think they do that particular one in Waco doesn't do shows anymore because I reached out to them about a year ago and they're like, no, we don't book bands. I was like, man. No, it's a bummer. Yeah, they were in a strip mall, so I wonder if they were getting complaints. So um, we've been listening to some of your guys' music just as a as as a prep for this, and I, I you know, I'm I'm obviously as you can see around you, I'm a studio nerd. That's all I do is record, mix, and makes and make stuff. It's it's the only thing that I know how to do, and it's 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 my big passion. So Good for you. I wanted to ask you, um, what has recording been like for you? Because obviously, studio stuff is so different from live stuff. There's so much more like meticulous you know uh you know uh just just hair pulling going on usually um well that would depend on which record from when everything started to now where has like recording gone from was it more stressful in the beginning is it more stressful now that you guys really know what you're doing is it you know what like what has the growth of your recording process looked like well, I think the growth part would be more just that we know what we want it to sound like. Mm -hmm. um, because when we first started, we did a lot of dreamy life. And so our very first record, which is called Strike a Match, is only on Bandcamp. And that was recorded by Britt Robichaux. Um, and it was me and Jesse. And then Olivia, which I think is still on Spotify because Dreamy Life re released it. Yeah. We was also recorded at, at uh, Dreamy Life. At, Cloudland. I think I didn't say Cloudland before. So Cloudland Recording, mm -hmm. which Dreamy Life did a lot at. Mm -hmm. um, we did our first two recordings at Cloudland. And our second one, Olivia, was recorded by Robbie Rux. And it was actually Robbie's idea to put the synth on our song Dreamin', which is mm -hmm. why we're even a synth band at all. So shout right. out to Robbie. Yeah. Um, and it was actually Steve's synth that we borrowed. And then a year later, when people left i was like hey steve do you want to be in big heaven <laughs> um and bring your your juno um it was really when you don't really know what you want to sound like it's nice to have somebody to have a vision for you yeah um but then when you get some more experience and you do know what you want to sound like um you feel more confident in moving toward self-recording mm -hmm. um because our next, our next recording after that, oh, we did one more at Cloudland. And that one, even though we had, I think Robbie recorded that. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, he did. Robbie recorded that. But I had, I, I had more of an idea. And by then, we were like a five piece. And I was only singing. That was a whole other era. Um, and that was 2019. And then you know, things happened and nobody was recording anything unless they were yeah. recording at home. You probably never stopped. Um, but it was like we didn't have access to a studio and that cost money and everything. Yeah. Um, and then after that, Peter Waringa reached out to, to Brock, who was our guitar player before Kevin. And he was like, I have some really good ideas for you guys. And so um, I made contact with him and we recorded um, Last Words to My Lover with him. So that was my nice. song, Last Words. Yeah, I like that song a lot. Hey, thank I you. I was saving that for bands. Okay, podcast, we'll but. save that. <laughs> but, he, but that was at his home studio and he really, he's, what I like about Peter is that he, he told me he wants to just interpret what the artist wants. Like he didn't yeah. feel like he had to put his own stamp on it necessarily. Kind of a Steve Albini mindset. That's yeah. Always, yeah. Yeah. That's always good. Um, and he was, he was open to not everything being done there. So Brock had his own recording set up, which was pretty legit at his house. So he recorded all the guitars at his house and just sent it to Peter. So we did 
uh, vocals, bass, drums, and synth with Peter at his home studio. And then Brock sent him every guitar track, and he just dumped it all in. And I came back a couple of times and did some vocals, because you never want to do vocals on the same day, obviously. Yeah. Um, and then we re released that. And then uh, we worked with Peter a little bit more one more time, but this time at the Cove Studios. Do y'all remember that place? I've heard of it. Well, I think it closed. I don't know what happened with that place, but it was very professional. And um, we recorded a few, like the, the basics to a couple of tracks there. And then one, one track that never got released. I'm not sure what I'm going to do with it yet. But then after that, um, by then Kevin was in the band and he's got almost this setup at his house. I mean, like the room that we're in right now, mm -hmm. like we record and we rehearse yeah, in a room yeah. about this size and it's actually his, his detached garage. Nice. Um, so now we just get to do everything in house. It's really, you know, as, as much as I want to support, you know, local engineers, artists, you know, and everything, it, it really is for me, the only way to go is to do it yourself. Uh, just, just for the simple fact that nobody knows how you want to sound like more than you do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And then you get that immediate feedback. Right. Like you listen back and you're like, I want to change. Like, for example, what those, one of the songs we're about to release, um, had a huge, not a, not a change in the way the vocals were sung, but the way that, well, not the melody, but the way that I sang them sure, and like also the, the effects. Like the timbre. Like yes, the, yeah, the timbre. Yeah, 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 you know, we listen totally. back and we're like, this doesn't really match the vibe that I want, so can we just change it? And then, like, you know, at a studio, that would have been another X number of dollars mm -hmm. and not at a professional. I mean, it is a professional studio, but it's not a commercial studio. Right. That's what I'm the word I'm looking for. Um, you know, it's more economical that way. Right. And frankly, things are expensive now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but just to just to echo something that you said earlier, it, you know, as much as the DIY thing is so valuable for us, especially now in the 21st century, anybody can get a copy of Logic or Pro Tools or whatever and uh -huh. and and start cooking. Um, it does require a ton of experience, a ton of work, a ton of labor and 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 just and just an absolute nerd passion to to get good at it in the first place. Let me ask you one last thing, and again, kind of in the studio space, who is the pickiest about their parts? <laughs> I am definitely up there. You mean about the the performance of the parts? Perfectionism, Man, constantly re-recording the same thing me, over and over until it's right. A thousand percent me, a thousand percent. Um, yeah. Sam is the least to his credit, but he has this, he has a mojo where he only has to play something like twice on a recording and it's done. Right. I don't know what that is. I, yeah. Like, awesome. Like, it's incredible. Kevin, Kevin also is very, well, also I'll say this. Kevin lives there. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, he can, he can go in. He can just keep cooking. He can just yeah. keep cooking. Yeah. So I actually don't know how picky he is, but I don't think he's as picky as me, but I am the one that they have to say, that sounds good. Leave it alone. So how many, how many passes? So like, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to out myself here. Right. I, when I, uh, the, the most frustrating day of my life was, so for, for those who don't know, you're recording a lot of DAWs, digital audio workstations will number tracks as you're recording them. And the most gut punch feeling I ever felt was when I was spending an entire day tracking vocals and I just stupidly looked at how many track, how many, how many attempts at this stupid line I had done. And it was in the seven hundreds. That's okay. a lot. It's a lot. I, I don't think I ever got up that high. So, but so I feel that I understand. Yeah. So, yeah. so what's the most number of times ballpark that you have attempted a single phrase line take before just finally saying, you know, good is good. Probably 30. Okay. And that was on one song, one or two different phrases, just the, the way the vowel was and the mm -hmm. where it sits in my voice. And, and like the worst part is like, I wrote this song. Like I could have picked any key, right? You know, yeah. and I picked this key, not sure why. Well, I do know why, but. But yeah, probably 30. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that was that felt like a lot. 700. 
Did you take a walk? <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot. I could you talk? I was I was <laughs> I was incredibly frustrated by the end of it. Yeah. Because you 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 know this again. You know this this is also me not being a great singer and not being a trained singer mm-hmm. was not realizing that after a certain point you're not getting any better at it. You're just hurting your instrument. Um. So yeah, I I just all I ended up doing was frustrating myself and hurting myself at the end of it. Uh, lesson learned uh, yeah. in a very very real hardcore way. Yeah, I started. Absolutely. I started taking your advice, which is if I don't get it in fifteen minutes, I go do something else. Yep. And then I come back to it, and that's been really, at least at the, at the minimum, helping with my sanity while I record. Yeah. It's a lot less like expletives the m- scream the from my room. The most yeah. important thing is to, <laughs> you got to keep cooking. So if Something isn't working. Put it on the back burner and move on to something yeah, else. That's sure. that's always been my method. Yeah, yeah. And I like I like that 15 minutes because then it's like I'm gonna have a stopping point. And if I'm there, I'm there. And if I'm not, I can take a break. Yeah. That's that's a good guideline. Um, are there any plans for touring at any point for Big Heaven? I would love to get out of town. It would probably. It would probably look more like a weekend run out somewhere. Um, but you know, like we all have day jobs Yeah, that makes it really tricky. Um, but I would really like to get down to Austin and like maybe do like an Austin Houston three day, four day thing. Mm. That would be really fun. Um, I've done that more times than I can count. It's fun. It's worth it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it would be, um, did you break even? (laughs) 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 Uh, not every time. Um, uh, I'll, I'll I'll tell you this. Uh, a couple of times we played to we played with cool bands to big crowds. We sold a ton of merch, and you know we we you know we made out like bandits. That was about maybe one or two times. Okay. Sometimes we drove for eight or nine hours to play in front of three people, just like we could do if we drove fifteen minutes out. You know, out here in Fort Worth. And ended up just essentially spending a bunch of money on garbage gas station food and gas. Yeah, you know, that's yeah. that's essentially you know. That's always the risk. It's it's been both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, our merch game is pretty strong, so I feel like we would we would probably do okay there, and we bring a lot of energy. Um, but yeah, like if they just aren't in the building, right? You know, that's three T-shirts. <laughs> I mean, you know, yeah. So uh-huh. to be to TBD on that. Yes. <laughs> Um, so you said you're working on new songs or yes, a new song? They are. We have a three song EP. Um, we're just, we're the artwork stage. We want to make it really good. And that's another thing. Um, like we may be a little bit hung up on the artwork as, as sometimes happens with the recording, yeah. you know, the visual is also really important. And that actually took me a long time to realize cause I'm not, I appreciate art. I love art, but I'm not a visual artist. So like one time for one song, um, they were like, where's the artwork? I'm like, it's one song. Why do I even have to have artwork? And then I got this like long reason why I was like, oh, okay. Cause it, cause of the way that we consume music now, right? Right. you know, you kind of yes. have to have yeah. something to look at. Um, so yeah, we're just, we're just waiting on that, um, to percolate and yeah. then we're going to, I'm going to upload it to the, to the services, but the songs are recorded. They're ready to Sweet. go. Is there anything different about them or kind of the same vibe or yes i'm so glad you asked so the first song the, the whole track the music was written by kevin and then i added the lyrics and the second song it was all written by stephanie um our keyboardist and backing well we're kind of dual vocals now i guess so that's totally her song Sick. and then the third song is very um it's we have slow songs as you know mm-hmm. but this one's much more in a shoegazy like loud um what is another word i'm looking for like a noise band kind Slow of vibe. Core kinda Slow, yeah, yeah yeah it has i think that one has like 15 guitar tracks wow cool Sick. so yeah Sick. at the big part so uh so. so so that's actually a great segue as to do you guys have a a typical approach towards songwriting is there usually you know you know, one member of the band brings the seed to the song and then everybody just adds their parts. It sounds like to me like what you're describing is a bit more of a democratic process. Well, it is now. Um, since when Jesse and I started 
I was a very new songwriter, um, and he had some songs, but mm. I had, but I had been in bands, and there was a couple of songs that I had written that weren't necessarily appropriate for the bands that I was in at the time. Sure. Um, but I'd be like, "Hey, I've got this song, and I want to bring it." And so, over a couple of weeks, more and more of my songs started being in our in our first little sets, and then um, and then it became. By the time Jesse left and Ricky left when Jesse did, we were playing almost all my songs. So because I've been the constant, consistent band member since the beginning, they've I, the songwriting has fallen on me. Yeah. Um, which is fine, and I'm glad that I've I've had to have that push because I've discovered that um, it is it is a really important creative outlet for me that I didn't know. Cause I've always been a musician, sure. but I never saw myself as a songwriter. Like, like when I was a lot younger, like I loved Tori Amos and Stevie Nicks and like these amazing songwriters. And I would just be like, I don't even know how they do that. Like, yeah. I don't even want to try cause I don't even know how they do that, you know? Um, so it just, it took me, I'm kind of a late bloomer in that way. Sure. Um, but I am really grateful now for the consistency that we've had since 2021 of membership because they've been able to bring ideas forward mm -hmm. and it takes a lot of pressure off. And, um, I love being able to support Stephanie as a new songwriter and I love collaborating with Kevin and I know also that it, I, I do have one that's ready to go. Like I've, I recorded it on GarageBand and I just have to teach it to everybody. Mm -hmm. But the problem, that's not a problem, but the challenge with that is that it's got so many parts that it's almost going to take as long to get it up to speed live. Right. right? Yeah, you know, like sure. you record something, but then it's got to sound like that thing. Right. So we could also just all write a song together and it would be about the same amount of time. Yeah. So there's, there's that push and pull, but yeah, like I really appreciate the current collaboration that we've had now for the last year or so. Cool. Yeah. Um, and you'll, and you'll hear that on the recordings. This, this is a question I really like to ask songwriters. Uh, it's, it's my favorite question. Um, cause it's, it's, it, so, so let me give you some, some backdrop real quick. Um, you know, um, Alex and I both write tons and tons of songs. And, uh, you know, it, one, of my, one of my favorite things is we have very different approaches to things. Um, I, because I'm an instrumentalist first, I play guitar, bass, piano, drums. Singing is the, the last thing on my mind. I tend to write the instrumental and then just send it off over to Alex and let him figure out what the vocals are going to be. But one of the things that I tend to do is I... Now, knowing Samantha and Alexis and Alex as well as I do, I try to write from a perspective of I know who's going to play this part, right? I have, a, I have a conscious understanding of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm writing a bass line that I want to challenge Samantha, but I also want it to be something that's like something that Samantha would have written, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, the more and more that I get to know these players, the more I right around the way that they work. So uh, my question to you is, how much are you considering the other musicians whenever you compose versus throwing shit at the wall and like seeing what sticks and just, and, and then just, oh, they'll figure it out if they figure it out. That's a really great question. Um, my traditional songwriting strategy has been girl with an acoustic guitar. Mm -hmm. So, which makes it nice to bring that, like the song is written, the song is composed, mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the sections are obvious, and then allowing, the, allowing my bandmates to build on that with really interesting bass line. Like when we had, when Peter was the bass player, like he was a very melodic bass player. And so I would know that he, he would add something that I didn't think of, or actually he would actually add something that I would think of, but he would just add it without consulting me, which was awesome. Um, That's always good. Right. We're Brock and now Kevin, very skilled, very melodic, very musical guitar players. They're not just technic. They're not just technical. So I can, I can trust them. Sam, Sam always comes with, with like, Oh, what if I put this fill here? Like I can always trust them with, um, whatever they're going to make the song into. Mm -hmm. So now, now that we are, it is probably is going to move more in the direction that you were talking about. And, um, 
the reason that we haven't done that before is just because of the a little bit of inconsistency with who's playing what. Mm -hmm. So until until last year, I didn't know that I was ever going to go back to bass with Big Heaven. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that we were going to lose Peter. And I was playing keys, and Stephanie was was singing back up and doing all the auxiliary auxiliary percussion. So we had like this really thick sound on stage. It's like this is so awesome. Like I'm always gonna have a tambourine player. I'm always gonna have dual vocals. I've you know I've I'm a pretty good piano player, so I'm I'm happy with keys. And so like that song I was just talking about that's on my Garage Band that's ready. I recorded that thinking of. Peter's going to play bass and I'm going to play keys and Stephanie's going to sing back up and all that stuff. So I guess I was kind of thinking yeah, in that yeah. way, but now, now I'm going to have to teach this kind of complicated keyboard part to Stephanie, yeah. um, which will be fine. Like she's up to the challenge. It's, it's, it's good. Um, but yeah, I, now that we are more in our spots, right. I can start thinking more in that direction. Cool. Um, or or still just be a girl with a guitar and like this is the song. Yeah. Um, I kind of want to hear this. I kind of want to hear this here. But you know, y'all do what you want with it. Right. So. Yeah. I mean, I always, I also, <clears throat> always subscribe to like the Rivers Cuomo Weezer kind of songwriting, which is if it works on an acoustic guitar, it works. Yeah. Just acoustic and vocals. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Like if you can scale it up. If you can scale it down and it's the same song. It, it still hits the same feeling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. So so then let me ask, um, in the transition from studio to live, how much wiggle room is there? Because I'm an improvisationalist through and through. I'm, I'm, I'm a jazz boy before I'm anything else. Nice. So for, for me, as much as I love good songs, I also love just, Wailing, just getting up there and, and, and doing whatever whatever feels good in the moment. We have a lot of songs, especially from the early catalog, that are way too short. Mm -hmm. And so definitely making those longer. I love doing that. Um, there's some room. I think that what people would notice live more is just less synths. And that's just because um, our songs tend to just have like three or four or five synth tracks mm -hmm. when we add it. And then, you know, we have one synth player and she's got... Two hands and two keyboards, but she's right. only going to play one at a time. <laughs> you know, she's, you know, I don't want Getty Lee. It's fine. Like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's okay. Um, so, yeah, there's some room there. Cool. Um, just as long as everybody is on the same page. And, like, Sam will, Sam will do, like, an extended ending. That's totally fine. Um, the new slow song, the one I was telling you, it's kind of shoegaze. Yeah. Um, sometimes we drag that one out like an extra minute at the end because it's just a big loud jam. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, there's some room. Cool. Yeah, totally. Very cool. Sweet. Mm -hmm. um, before we wrap it up, what was our worst gig that just happened? <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> just we played. Oh, uh, what was that place called? <laughs> um, so we, oh, I love that bar. <laughs> <laughs> we 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 talked about how fun it is whenever you're playing like these cool little intimate spaces right. that don't have a stage per se, and you're just kind of there with the crowd. Except when there's like a couch and a recliner and a bunch of other stuff <laughs> taking up space on the stage. So our so Alexis, our drummer is tucked away in a corner. You can't even see her because there's like a wall baffle up against her. So if you were out in the crowd, you're just hearing, you know, drums, guitars, and bass, but you're not even seeing half the band because she's literally behind a wall. Plus, there's also a speaker stand and a speaker that doesn't work in front of her. Well, the 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 speaker was working <laughs> or, okay. until halfway through the set yeah, when it mean. started yeah. feedbacking and smoking or it, something. Or I didn't see the smoke. I just heard it not making sound. Yeah. That is not but the I first was time singing. that's happened there Yeah, with, with power. I heard that with Lifeless Display. They, mm. they said, like, we broke the sound system, and yeah. I messaged Victor, or, or not Victor, uh, Jack, and I was like, what, wait, is there no sound system tomorrow? And he was like, I, I didn't hear so anything about it. that wasn't a joke? No, I guess not. It, uh, it sounds like there's evidence <laughs> behind it. <laughs> but yeah, just, it, it was so tight, like, I've played tight shows. That was a tight show. Well, like, yeah. Alex is left-handed, too, and I'm right-handed, so I had lot. to, like, angle myself and I was like, no. but I was also yeah. directly like in front David of Tell one of the Jeff speakers. So, 
We had we had all the mics. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying really hard not to cl like clash and hit Alex with my bass, and there's feedback happening because I'm like too close with the microphones and speakers, and I was just like, oh my gosh. Yeah, and I I brought. I mean, it was like a bring your own gear show. And I brought all my oh, own yeah, my and like cables. Two of your cables went out. My cables were all fine, but wow. I, I was like, you know what? I'll try and have a very minimal mess. Let me use their cables first, and if there's a problem, we'll go. And of course, like two of their cables were, yeah. were bad. And I was like, I should have just used all my <laughs> cables. I can rap fast. It's fine. Was that for a, a festival, or was that just a one-off? No, it was just a one-off. It was just a. Yeah. It was just a cute little gig. And I, I will say, we were on fire the whole night. Like we played really well. Yeah. I thought we sounded really good. Yeah, you get the energy of the crowd. Yeah, but all of that frustration. I have seen bands there, and I've had to stand on the booth just to see the band. Like, if yeah. there's too many people, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it was it was it was a it, it's it's a fun little space. Don't know if I ever want to play a show there again. <laughs> yeah, fair or, enough. Yeah, or we did we just lean into it and just sit on the couches. Just I mean, yeah, put, that I, put I, mics I, up the lazier to the couch. that we look. Yeah. It would be it would be funny at least get a video out of it. Yeah. I thought they moved them. I'm trying to remember. Even those being in the space when we've played there. There's like, so it's like this U shape. I have a yeah. Picture. Uh, yeah. Like uh, over by the back door. So you've got like this little wall, and then it goes up to the window, and there's a couch in right. front of the window. That's yeah, just barely. Oh, but yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. It's a tight mm -hmm. spot. Yeah, and then people like walking in and out of, I'm going to give too much away. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. And I mean, uh, like I said, I, I love the space. Um, you might want to bleep this part out too, <laughs> for the simple fact that it's right across the street from the awesome arcade oh, right yeah. next door. Yeah. yeah. Which I have been thinking ever since then, dude, we need to jam in an arcade. Like I'm, that's a spot for us I'm to play in, a show dude. at. I'm Free in play has a rooftop. Show. That's too. a great yeah. idea. I wonder if they would let us do that. That would be awesome. Okay. There's like also there's also a uh, a place literally right down the street from here called Electric Starship that has had bands play. What kind of place is that? Uh, it's an arcade. Oh, um, okay. They they have like a bunch yeah, of the classic stuff, but they also have a, like a bunch of the modern games too. You know, they have the what is it the um, Killer Queen Bee game. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. They have a bunch of like cool like Japanese imports. Cool and stuff. Yeah. Um, and as you come into the building, off to the left, there is a stage, and there's been, I've seen, like, cover bands there, I've seen, like, uh, you know, uh, I've actually been thinking about hitting them up myself for, like, my electronic music. Oh, because yeah. Because what goes better with arcades than, like, bleep bloops, Absolutely. You know? I love electronic music, too. I was going to tell you that. That's really cool that you record that. <laughs> They're the electronic machines. Nice. All right, so... Wrapping it up, anything you want to plug, anything you want to talk yes. about, final? I did think of a really cool other gig, uh, sep yes. not September, February 17th at Chat Room. Thank you, Day John Carney, for having us there. Cool. That was really awesome. Um, what's coming up? July 18th. No, not the 18th. I keep saying that. Bloop, bloop, bloop. July 19th, which is a Friday, we're playing at Armory Deep Ellum, Ooh. which Ooh. I think possibly also is a PA situation, so that'll be fun. But anyway, we're playing with Mean Motor Scooter. Oh, hell nice. yeah. And this band from Minnesota called the Shackletons. Okay, And cool. so they have a, they hit us up, and I was like, oh, I'll check you guys out. And they have like a, they sound like Weezer, if Weezer was from the Midwest. Yeah. They have a really cool, and like with a little vintage vibe. So that's going to be a really interesting it's going to be like three vintage flavored bands from different eras. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. July 19th. It's a Friday night at Armory Deep Ellum. You destroyed my sweater, don't you know? <laughs> <laughs> so I am bad at accents. Exactly. Dude. Well, it was almost Canadian. Yeah. It was close. <laughs> yeah. Well, nothing like a gigs to wrap it up on a bad Alex <laughs> joke. <laughs> um, what's the thing we normally do at the end? Oh, ba da ba. Ba -da -ba. Yeah, would yeah. you join us in a, we do a one, two, three, and we go, ba -da -ba. <laughs> Do we do a ba -da -ba. You can no. add any kind of harmony you uh, want yeah. to. Okay, okay. One, two, three. Ba -da -ba. Ba -da -ba. Nice. <laughs> nice. I've missed doing that. 